Uh, I'm the SGA president here at Georgia State, and we've been advocating for students here on campus for yeah, as long as I can remember. And we've been advocating at the Capitol, me personally, for at least three years. Uh, but last year and this year are particularly important because the change that they made in the Oak Scholarship have really, really, really impacted the students, not only the students' wallets, but the students' ability to, to get the education here at Georgia State. Because it's not just can you pay for it, but is that paying for it such a distraction that it's actually hurting your scholastic ability to, to perform? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, today the, the budget and how to be an advocate for students. Uh, but at the same time, we're also going to talk, uh, give you guys all a chance to talk about how the changes of the Oak Scholarship have impacted you personally. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to my good friend Janice. Janice is a uh, one of the people that have really just been a huge advocate on uh, the Hill for students. Uh, and it's, it's just an awesome person all around. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. There's Thanks, James. Um, I'm Janice Burroughs, and I am a lobbyist at the Capitol most of the time. Um, I'm a law grad, class of 97, which tells you how old I am. Um, but all the stuff I'm doing now for grassroots groups uh, wasn't anything they taught me in law school. Right? It's the nuts and bolts of sort of finding out who your legislator is and going, talking to them, and then having the confidence to do that in a way that's, that's productive. Um, how many of you guys saw the paper on Sunday? Big headline about how much trouble hopes in. Right, number two. All right, nobody reads the AJC anymore, but it's on AJC.com. Um, two, and essentially, just now, like the, the reporters and the legislators that passed the law last year at Capitol are starting to get what some of you have probably already figured out which is that their um, plan to save hope uh, maybe isn't going to work at all. And so while they asked everybody to take these deep cuts last year and sort of justify it by saying we'll save the program, um, the program essentially, as you know it, is going to be gone by the time our current class of high school freshmen get to college. Um, and so having you know the folks that show up around the world, right? <laughs> And at the Capitol, there haven't been a lot of students showing up. So I'm really interested um, with the, the Hope for Georgia campaign in trying to help students, A, understand that they've got a dog in this fight. <laughs> Number two, figure out if I was going to do something about that, what could I do that might actually get heard? Um, and be effective advocates for themselves in the process. Um, you've got a lot of other things on your plate, because now you have to keep a higher GPA if you're on Hope. And, and of course, it's um, most people aren't in politics. It's a dirty word, and it's sort of. You can see the capital from campus, it's over there. Um, but one of the biggest changes they made last year um, in the law that, that downsized hope basically was not just to create different flavors of hope and to make it harder to get, harder to keep, and give you less money when you actually earn it. Um, they also were very um, uh, helpful in saving the program, according to the legislators. They now require that there's a tight relationship every year between how much money the lottery brings in and how much hope recipients get. So the good news is um, there's a lot more accountability in this process, right? Now you've got legislative committees, the budget committees actually meeting, and they have never heard from a student, I would venture to guess, about what any of these programs, you know, how it's working for you. Um, and so they're very sure that, you know, they, they're helping and they don't know what they don't know. Right? And so students are especially, how many of you are on Hope or want to be? <laughs> was. Was. Okay, was. so we're definitely going to hear your story in a sec. Um, I think that what's a lot of the pain that students are feeling over here is kind of gotten siloed off from what the legislators are doing to help over here. And if these two groups of folks don't learn how to talk to each other pretty quickly, um, I'm pretty convinced that there won't be a Hope Scholarship, period. Here, you know, in the next, by the time my seventh grader gets to college. <laughs> um, and so I come at this as a parent, I come at this as somebody who's been at the Capitol for a long time and have, have built grassroots campaigns to help get um, single issues heard. And it's not political in the sense that I don't care who you voted for or what candidate you're into, and if you, you know, won't have any part of a, a politics as usual, this is a nonpartisan sort of you coming in as the expert on the subject finding out who it is that's going to make these decisions that are going to impact your life, and then figuring out, you know, how do I engage these folks in dialogue. So a lot of um, what I've done over the years is help kind of create the audio information that prepares you guys to have that conversation 
and to sort of do, you know, field trips and the hand holding to help you see that it's not rarefied air over there in the gold dome. Um, legislators don't fight, and you vote for them. So by definition, you're somebody that they actually want to hear from. Um, of course, how many of you have ever been to the Capitol to, for anything at all? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. What were you there for, anybody? I went to the Capitol Day last year. Okay, so, again, so that was a student advocacy. Okay, that's, that's good stuff. You're ahead of me. Anybody else? Tea Party back in 2008. Okay, and were you guys outside? Yeah. You know, sort of the protest mode? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else actually been in the building and had talking points and went and found your legislator and said, hi, I'm Janice Barocas and I need you to... Okay, that's what we teach people to do, right? And that's, um, and that's how you kind of connect your expertise as a student, what it means to you with what decision they've got in front of them right now. Um, so the biggest decision they, they've got is the budget. And it's whatever, $16 billion odd dollars every year, and they all get to decide who gets how much of it based on what's most important. And so if they don't hear from anybody who thinks that line item is important, it's really easy to cut. And so far they haven't heard a whole lot from students. Um, but I think we're about to change that. And so we're gonna have some good opportunities um, for advocacy coming up, lots of committees that are talking about this issue and um, to the extent that you guys actually are the experts and you can say whether this fix is working for you or if it's not, what might be more helpful and what you had to do to kind of react to it. Um, it's, it's scary news for me as a parent who's saving for college for a kid um, to find out they're gonna change how much is in the program every year. The price tag will change. So where hope used to be 100% and you knew what that meant, right? It's actually gonna be a changing game um, every year and I don't think that anybody really thought that one through when it was proposed I think that sounded like a good idea to make it flexible um, on the flip side you know if your education requires four years or the free program you're in requires five years and your intention is to stay you know stay the course right every year finding out what it's going to cost you isn't going to work for a lot of folks um, yeah Sorry, sorry, is, the, is the main reason that this is happening because the Georgia Lottery isn't bringing up in as much revenue as they expected it to, or what it did before? Um, so there's a couple, there's a lot of moving parts on this. I'm going to turn off even the vibrate on my phone. That's annoying me. Um, I think it's a combination of things, right? The lottery is bringing in less revenue than it used to, but the cost of tuition has gone straight up. You got recessions and more people are going back to school because they may or may not have work opportunities elsewhere. Um, and so it's kind of the perfect storm now, right? You've got fewer dollars, which means the people who actually speak up and lobby for what it is that they're concerned about and do you know, some engagement um, are going to be the people who do better in the process, period. You know, the world is one run by the people that, that show up, essentially. That's, I can't say it a simpler way. That's pretty much what, what it boils down to. So there's a lot of other monies out there, besides the lottery dollars that can pay for the things that we think are important as a state. Um, and, and they need to be motivated. The political will needs to be created to take, you know, look at what else we do as a state, you know, and then make the decision if this is really as important to us as we say it is, building a skilled workforce, having students who aren't crippled with student loan debt, then uh, we've got to find the dollars. It's not a question of if, it's just a question of how. And I think it's kind of red herring at times when people say, well, it's just because the lottery revenue is declining. If the lottery turned into a you know, big cash cow like it was back in the mid-90s again tomorrow, I'm still not sure that if students weren't saying, this is what my solution looks like, anybody else would know how to, how to fix it. And all that really works for real life people. Yeah. I um, appreciate your optimism. I've been working with a group called George Students for Public Higher Education yeah. at the Capitol a lot last year when they're uh, but um, what, to what extent do you think they would, I mean, because like over the past three years we've looked at like some pretty severe cuts and we've been at the Capitol, we've been at hearings. We've sent postcards to every legislator and things like that. So I think we're a little bit like, I mean, I definitely hear what you're saying and appreciate your expertise, but like how much, this is probably a hard question, but how much are they even considering giving to 
education, do you think, would they, if like a bunch of students showed up, do you think they consider reversing hope cuts even? Two minute budget lessons, stop me if this is deadly boring and you already know it. Okay. Right, the way the state budget works, and last year what you were advocating on was a bill, was a piece of legislation. No matter what that bill said, policy is nothing without money. The state budget process is where the advocacy needs to happen, right? And so that process was not at all appealed to, students weren't engaged in that process. I would argue students didn't know that that process existed. And last year, it really didn't. Lottery funds, up until they passed the bill last year, weren't going through the state appropriations process, right? So now they are. So now is the you know the time to have your conversation and have it with the right people who sit on that committee. You know, it's and so it's kind of less of a broad brush. Let's say we're unhappy, and this is where it gets more surgical. And because my background over the years has been in state budget work, specific line items, you know, in the in the billion plus dollar document. Uh, 16 billion um, now, but it's down about a billion from where it was in higher ed funding. And I think the conversations that we had last year um, probably sowed you know, some fertile ground. Um, different targets this year, different conversation, and yes, we're just at the front end of that process. The governor's recommendations underfunded the programs, I think, but the House will start making their subcommittee decisions in the next two weeks. And those people need to hear from students, and then it'll go to the Senate. And the Senate Budget Subcommittee will start making those decisions, and they need to hear from students. And when those two groups try to reconcile their final decisions, when they disagree, and they will, by definition they do, um, typically students need to be there at the conference committee at the very end to say, you know, if you did do something for us, thank you, and hold the line. We vote. We the, care. The legislatures, uh, they have committee meetings, right? And I know, I know I've seen you at community meetings before. We've gone up and actually uh, spoke uh, and advocated at those meetings. Uh, this year, um, the Georgia Student Finance Commission actually came in and testified about what percentage was actually going to get paid for. They sold us last year this 90% this of tuition number. And of course, they were able to testify this year already that it's around 80 this year. Yeah. And that by 2014, it's going to be uh, like total cost of school. It's actually they're actually going to only fund less than 50 percent of the total cost of going to school. Uh, now, this is what we were telling them last year. This is what I told them last year. Uh, this is what many of you told them last year. And yet, the people in the room seem very surprised by that number. Uh, in fact, one of the quotes was, "Well, I went back to my constituents last year and told them that they would only have to pick up 10 percent, and yet now." You're telling me that it's it's going to be 50% by 2014. Uh, this is why it's so important for us not just to say, "Hey, we're against what you're doing," but here here are better solutions. Here are things that can actually help uh, and go, and not just tell the Senate and tell the House, but tell each senator and each legislator. Uh, we can actually get them, pull them off the floor. Uh, you know, that's that's what this advocacy is for. To tell them, hey. This bill is not what you think it is, and there's a better idea, and this is what it is. I have a quick proposal. I know that under height and budget, and they're going to have to cut something, but instead of cutting across the board, can we propose them to cut, especially from the schools that are not accredited, because there are a lot of schools that really make no sense, but they still get more scholarship to people that attend. I actually attended such a school for a sign up first and it's really easy to get 4.0 so you can get more costs covered and get uh, lower uh, quality of education, whereas at your schools it's harder to get a good GPA, it's harder to get funding. So um, I don't know if you're going to go there and lobby, I think it would be a good idea to propose the idea that and we should appreciate the schools by their right accreditation. That's a conversation that students need to have with elected officials. I mean, right? Because A, it's something that's lost in translation. If you attended, and I'm trying to re, you know, reiterate your story. Um, but the pieces that are going to matter most about your story are how hard the institutions you're talking about are lobbying for their budget, um, and who their friends are, basically. I mean, essentially, if students are not a visible, outspoken group, 
right? It's very easy to say, well, we helped the one person who came to us. I'm sure it was the head of some proprietary school you might be referring to, who said, we're very valuable in our community, right? And we want um, and need our students to access hope. And if we're gonna have to make hard choices, I, I think students need to put in the, the mix, what I value, what's better for me. And that's a great suggestion. They, I think they need to hear that. Yeah, if you've got class and need to cut out, please yeah, go ahead. <laughs> My contact information is on this, and um, let's stay in touch. Yeah, I've already got it. Well, we, we really like to hear from, from y'all, how has the hope affected you, has it affected your family, how has it affected your disguise for future? Uh, I know that for, for me, without the hope scholarship, as it was last year, there was, there's no way I could have gone to college. Uh, none at all. Uh, if, even if it was $1,000 a semester, it might as well have been a million. Uh, there's no way I could have gone to college. Whereas now, they're expecting everyone to pay a larger portion of it, uh, even those that have the, the merit for that full ride scholarship. Uh, it's it's a little a little disheartening. Uh, my little brother, for instance, he saved up, you know, for the cost of you know fees and books and this sort of stuff, his college fund. But knowing that he only needed a 3.0, he kept that 3.0 and now graduated right after they changed it. Now at a junior college in middle Georgia going, well, wait a minute, you said that if I had this GPA, you would cover your half of it. It's sort of a contract with him that he sort of feels betrayed. So we want to we want to give you guys a chance to, to express how this has actually affected you. So um, I've had hope since I started uh, at school and my father, he saved money for me, he saved about eight grand since I was born. Um, but of course, that eight grand is gone. Um, with housing, books, um, just small stuff you need when you go to college. And I even saved money before I went to school. Even though I knew it was going to have help, even though I knew that was going to be covered, I saved um, a little over a thousand dollars so I wouldn't have to work freshman year. But after freshman year, I've been working every single day um, for school. And this semester is my, I mean, this is my undergraduate in May. And it was. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> fall, I, um, they, I went to financial aid office to make sure everything's okay, um, do whatever I need to do. I haven't taken out loans, and he tells me that, oh, here's a form of hope to policy. Okay, I'm like, okay, I, that's fine. I read over it, and I'm like, um, it says that now hope is not covering, they used to, now they cover only a certain amount of hours, like they used to cover, if you started the semester with hope, and that would be your last semester with Hope, it doesn't matter how many hours you would take, it would cover the entire semester. Well, then they changed it to only a certain amount of hours. So I had to scramble to find money. Like, I didn't want to take out a loan. I've been, I've had a 3.4 since freshman year, still today, and I might have a 3.8. There's no reason that my grades shouldn't be able to take me, you know, where it should as far as money is concerned. Um, but I took out the loan, I didn't want to, and then I took out another loan for this semester, but it really, it was a struggle. I couldn't, my father, he's unemployed, he couldn't, I couldn't use him, I had to use myself, it, you know, the rates are high. I mean, I might as well have taken out loans for the first day I started because it was so much money that I had to take out to cover for the rest of my classes. Like, it covered like three hours and I had a full load to take. So, um, it's like, I could have been taking out a loan from the start. Yes, I'm fortunate I'd have to be like everyone else and leave out here with a forty thousand dollar debt, but it's close near to ten thousand for one year. And that doesn't make any sense. So that's my story, it's how it affected me. You know, we have heard a lot of stories like that where the students have focused so hard on their, you know, academic careers and their academic uh, standing and they've got these awesome GPAs and you know, they've done all this awesome <coughs> academic work. And then all of a sudden their their hope runs out, or you know now that the rules have changed, you know a huge portion of hope isn't covered, and you you go to register and they say, oh yeah, you you can keep going, but now you need three thousand dollars. Right. Well, how am I going to get three thousand dollars next week? And this uh, is at registration. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is at right. registration. We're not talking about planning windows. Thank you. <laughs> they told me because I'm I am a planner. I check before summer. Um, 
started, what was gonna be, and then end of summer is when you're letting me know when school starts in a couple of weeks. Like, I did what I had to do, of course, I would do that. They put your back against the wall, which isn't fair. They don't, they didn't give me um, proper notice. Um, I know I got a letter in the mail, but come on. It, it, the, way, the way I thought it was is if you, the regulation that you start out with, at least should be the ones you end with. Not, it changes just whatever year, because that's not fair, I graduated in 2007. I mean, it should still apply the same way it did back then. And, and it's, it's the same thing now, instead of being able to solely focus on academics and graduating. I have three have jobs. Have the, yeah, yeah you have, you've got three jobs now. Oh, I, I have three yeah. jobs now as well. And it's, it's all of a sudden, we're not going to college to succeed at college. We're going to college to pay, pay for, for college. college. It's, right. it's sort of a weird and now, Even that GPA on three jobs exactly. is going to be a and feat. Now, maybe you can pull it off. And no one can just, pull off a 3.7 in the entire four years. Like, there, I'm not saying there is no one, but there are very, very few people that will be able to hold that 3.7. And I know they know how unattainable that is. And that's not fair, because even with the little social life I had and everything, to still maintain 3.4 was hard, yeah. beyond hard. So for, I think 3.0 is a perfect standard. For them to go above it is, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's simple as that. And you're, you're actually an honor student here. Yeah, I'm an honor student. I mean, it just, it's just unfortunate because I know others, and I know the hope is amazing. Like, and I, but I know other states that do it too. I know Florida does something like it. Um, my sister went to the University of Florida and um, they have a bunch of scholarships that she got a whole, a lot of money back. I know she went to more expensive school, but she still got a lot of money back just for becoming in state. Um, and I forgot the name of the scholarship. But um, if other states are doing it, Georgia should be able to do it too. Like, if they're not going to, if they don't want to hold themselves to a standard around, for education, that's silly. Um, but I mean, it's pushing more people to not go to college. I mean, I know more people are in college, but people are starting to see that working towards your goal in life is probably better than spending four or five years in college and in debt and not being guaranteed anything. So they're just going to draw people away. Students are dropping out um, at technical colleges. I don't know if that's happening here yet. Um, but the numbers, um, the kids who aren't still in these seats are the ones I worry about most. Absolutely. Well, wants to share. Yeah, exactly. Um, how many of you would be interested in sitting through a committee at the Capitol, just if you had a comfort level about what was going on and some some good preparation for it, or or of your friends might be interested? Is really the the ask I want to leave you with um, because I'm a happy happy to be a part of helping you understand that process and sort of navigate it. I know that um, on your schedule with three jobs, this is one more thing to do. Um, but if if you don't bring that story, you know, and if other students who are, are really up against it don't bring that story, in the next couple months here, we're gonna pass another round of, you know, things to save hope. And, um, and I'm not sure that those, you know, end products of those conversations are necessarily gonna be useful to students unless students weigh in. As we go. Is it possible for students to break stories? I, I'm not a student here, but I work with an organization and mm -hmm. a lot of students who are affected by hope, but a lot of them are really shy and, and the idea of coming, even, even coming to this meeting and having to like talk and share yeah. a camera, like a lot of them are like, oh, I don't want to go. Mm -hmm. I know that they're affected by it. And um, yeah, is there, is there way, other ways for them to write? Well, la last year uh, we had several senators come in and they said if they get three letters in the mail, like someone wrote them a letter, uh -huh. that they consider that an emergency. Uh, a single that, issue. Yeah. Well, a single yeah. issue is three people write them from their yeah. constituencies. And so with just three letters, you can really affect a lot of change. Because if one, you know, somebody sends them an email, it's like, okay, that person is interested right. in XYZ. But if somebody writes you a letter, it's, wow, this person's really interested. And if three people do, I mean, their quote was, this is, we look at this as an emergency. We need to do something about that. Right. So they can really affect change, <coughs> even if they're too shy to go and talk. That's good enough, because we have 70 students in our organization. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm happy to talk to you about how to okay. get them kind of, there's, you know, there's the professional format for writing to legislators, and we want you guys to well represent um, your issues. Okay. But I'm happy to help you yeah, fill that out.
Well, thanks again for coming, everybody. This, these things kind of uh, matter a lot to everyone. They matter a lot to me. They matter a lot to those that are coming behind us. So uh, if you want to stay and talk to any of the media that are around, we really appreciate it.